Welcome back to Beyond the Uniform. I'm Justin Nasiri, and each week I meet with military veterans to learn about their civilian career, what they do, how they got there, and advice for other veterans seeking to do the same. Today's episode number 201 with the Disabled American Veterans and Jeff Hall. It was just one day, boom, there was order that came in and said, you have five days to clear post. So I had to cram it all in and turn in everything and get off, get off the military base, you know, within five days. But I wasn't planning on getting out. I was not planning on being injured, and, and no one is planning on being injured. But that's just one of those types of cases. But in general, I just think people would benefit greatly from preparing to get out as soon as they get in. And I don't mean that in not focused on the job you're doing in the military, but you got to plan for the day and foresee you're not going to be here forever. The Disabled American Veterans, or DAV, is a fantastic organization that supports the military community. If you, or anyone that you served with, would benefit from the DAV, please share this episode with them. In this episode, Jeff and I discuss the purpose and resources of the DAV. We also talk about volunteering and about meeting a veteran's needs for both purpose and connection after one's military service. We talk about understanding your your passion and military benefits, as well as the DAV's new program around employment, which helps vets and their families secure meaningful employment. So with that, let's dive in to my conversation with Jeff Hall. Joining me today in Cold Spring, Kentucky is Jeff Hall. Jeff, welcome to Beyond the Uniform. Thank you, Justin. Nice to be here. So for listeners, I wanted to give them a a brief look at your background. Jeff is the National Employment Director at DAV, which is the Disabled American Veterans. Uh, It is a nonprofit that provides a lifetime of support for veterans of all generations and their families. Each year, the DAV helps more than 1 million veterans by helping them access benefits they earned like health care, education, and disability, and connecting them to meaningful employment opportunities. Jeff started out in the Army, where he served in the infantry, and he is a combat-wounded veteran. He has worked at the DAV since 1993. Um, So, Jeff, maybe to start off, um, for people on active duty and military veterans listening, what would you want them to know about the work that the DAV does? Uh, It's it's really a great question from the standpoint of, you know, it it seems like yesterday when I got out of the military and I had been wounded in the Gulf War and when we came back, you know, there was one person that had said to me, you need to make sure you get in touch with the DAV, and, and frankly, I didn't know. And that was long before the Internet and things like that. And I didn't really know what the DAV did, but I knew it was of similar construct to some of the other veterans organizations. Um, And there was someone local there at Fort Hood. So I gained a little bit of insight, but never really dreamt at that point that I was going to engage in in a career path with DAV. Uh, It wasn't until I had, had separated out of the military and went back, moved back home to Indiana and then. Um, got in contact with DAV for some assistance with my VA claim, which actually happened to be stalled out if it wasn't for DAV at that particular time and contacting the local national service officer in Indianapolis. I may not have known or I would have been like thousands of people that are unfortunate um, each year that find themselves in in that crack of information or falling through the crack and, and so on and so forth. So uh, for me, uh, it started a whole cascade of learning a lot more about DAV and, and the many things. Like, for instance, uh, I didn't realize uh, the age of the organization, but we're getting ready to celebrate our 100th anniversary, which will be wow. uh, in 2020. So we've been around nearly 100 years providing uh, free and professional assistance to veterans and their families in, in a variety of ways, some of which you mentioned And each year, our service program that I mentioned briefly in my own case, and and for those that are sitting, you know, in a situation where they're on medical hold, uh, waiting to be transitioned out, or their their future is uncertain of what the process holds for them, fear not. Get a hold of DAV. Many are right there on your military base. Just go see them, our transition service officers that we have in a lot of locations. They can help you. Each year we submit nearly around three, I think last year alone it was around 300,000 claims or so uh, for disability benefits, and it resulted in more than $4 billion in annual and retroactive benefits. So you're in really great hands. Those of us that work for DAV in that capacity 
have been through it already in our own case, so take some comfort in that. So in addition to our service program, our voluntary service program, uh, we roll heavy with that where thousands of volunteers across the country provide uh, free transportation with our transportation program where we buy vans from Ford Motor Company because we've been in partnership with Ford since 1920. Hmm. Uh, we buy them at a reduced rate, and then we donate those to the VA medical centers. Many many people have seen these around, and it continues to grow, where we donate, uh, uh, I don't know, 100, 100 and a half of these vans every year. And then we provide the volunteer drivers that pick up veterans to and take them to and from their medical appointments, and many of those obviously would not have a way to get to and from if it weren't for our van program. And then, you know, general volunteering around the VA hospital, we save the government more than $40 million a year um, in costs that they would have to expend in having, you know, to pay for a particular service. So that's, uh, you know, a whole lot to do about our volunteer program. Uh, we most recently launched our volunteerforveterans.org, O-R-G, uh, program where we're getting volunteers. Uh, many people, especially those that I've found getting out of the military, may not be in such a hurry to, you know, to find the next job. Um, there's a lot of people out there that want to spend their time volunteering or maybe volunteer one day a week. Well, this is a good way that they can do that with a great organization like ours, volunteerforveterans.org. It's real easy to go online and sign up. And that puts you in touch with veterans in your particular geography and you set the parameters of that, of how, how far you're willing to travel or can travel uh, to help a veteran in need. And, and then veterans can also go on there if they need somebody to, you know, come and clean their gutters or pick something up from the store for them or whatever the case may be. And then, la you know, lastly, before the employment program, uh, our national advocacy program, which is our legislative program, I mean, obviously, we're a huge voice on the Capitol Hill. I used to work on that particular staff as well. And uh, we testify regularly before the House and Senate on a variety of issues, whether it's health care, benefits, improving benefits, establishing benefits, or, uh, you know, just the wide range of things that happen in, in the way of health care. The, the CHOICE program, which a lot of people know about, uh, as well as the most recent uh, huge effort DAV was uh, in the lead on, and that was uh, the uh, caregiver program to provide assistance to the the spouse or the caregiver of a, of a traumatically and seriously disabled veteran. Uh, we DAV is huge in those particular areas, but most recently in 2014 we launched the program that I'm privileged to uh, be the director of, and that is our National Employment Program, which we started up here in Cold Spring. Uh, and we basically have uh, three pillars that we stand that, or that particular program or uh, program on. With the, so with the mission of helping veterans and their families, whether it's active duty, guard, reserve, veterans, and their spouses, any one of those categories, help them secure meaningful employment. And the one thing I learned, Justin, uh, in the many years I've been with DAV, is not everybody getting out of the military is interested and or entitled to a variety of the benefits that are available to them. So not all will file claims. Not all people want to get involved with volunteering. Not all people want to get involved with grassroots lobbying, but almost everybody getting out of the military uh, is looking for that next opportunity, that next career, whether they're four years and are out or whether they serve 30 years. Everybody's looking, and that really was one of the huge things uh, that, that came up to me uh, with the second portion of the build because we have online tools and resources, which, uh, you know, for listeners – www.jobs.dav.org, jobs.dav.org. We have a variety of things, companies that we work with, Job Search Board, and a lot of the traditional things that you'll see, uh, as well as for employers out there, our hiring guide, which is a practical solutions guide uh, to helping hire and retain disabled veterans. That's something we encourage all employers to look at. And if you don't, you know, if you're not one, but you know one, you can hand that off to them. It's a very simple document uh, that's going to mean it's already uh, making a splash in that way. But also our full career fair schedule, which is kind of one of the larger time consuming things that we're involved with because we co sponsor. Uh, nearly 150 career fairs each year, uh, traditional and online or virtual. 
Virtual be virtual career fairs will be of particular interest to those that are still stationed abroad, or serving aboard a ship, or something like that that haven't transitioned out, or are just not simply living in a geography-based area uh, where we have one of our other career fairs. Because even though we do, you know, and there's only a couple of us that hit the road to do these, there's a lot of people that you know we just we know and realize that are serving in a lot of different areas where we don't go. So the virtual career fairs, they're really great, and they are what uh, people think they are. They work the same uh, without the face-to-face as what you would do. It's a live interaction with an employer. Um, And then, of course, our traditional or brick-and-mortar type career fairs, we do those from Boston to San Diego, Miami to Seattle, and kind of all points in between. We try to get everywhere, but uh, it's growing rapidly uh through that uh we've basically since july of 2014 uh we've sponsored more than a 400 traditional and virtual career fairs of more than 155,000 people have attended and in excess of 100,000 people have been offered jobs some people can be offered more than one job and that's true but uh 100,000 job offers is, is certainly great to look at when you're building a whole new program in a in a you know, uh, uh, an organization like DAV that's been around so many years. So those are the basic things, even though that sounds like a lot. DAV.org is a, is, is a place where you can, you know, certainly learn more about each one of our programs, but that's kind of the, the maybe the 15,000-foot view. This is great. And, and one of the things I wanted to dive into as well is that I, I've appreciated how the DAV has been very – outspoken about how finding a good job after military service is really critical uh, to make a veteran's return to civilian life successful. Could you talk about some of the obstacles you've seen veterans face in finding a good job after their service and maybe any any advice on how to approach those obstacles? Yeah, another great question, Justin, because I've learned a lot, just like veterans along the way and those getting out of the military. I've, I've been learning you know, as as we go, um, because admittedly, my background is not employment. Um, but I've, I, I did a quick uh, case study and things like this, where I started talking to a, you know, a variety of veterans and, and employers and learning what each one are looking for on both sides of the table and, and how that we can best be, you know, a good, valuable resource for veterans and their families uh, in this search. And I will tell you, Look, when when you have 250 or more, you know, nearly 250,000 people separating out of the military uh, each year, and again, uh, the majority, the vast majority of those are leaving the military and going into a new career. So uh, I don't think there's too many people that are leaving the military without the simple message of, now that I've done this, again, regardless if it's, you know, four years or, or 14 or 25 Getting a good job for that next thing to provide for your fa- yourself and or your family is the, is the key and how to go about it. Well, you know, transition GPS or going through the transition process on a military base uh, is uh, quite better in it's it's better in some places than it is in other places um, as far as duty station and command and, and whatnot. And there's just a whole lot of work that still needs to be done with the transition. Now it is better than when I got out in 92. Uh, it's a whole lot better. You know, basically we went in and they said, do you, if you want to stay and get the information, raise your hand. If you don't come sign out and you're done for the day. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're a lot better off, uh, plus veterans or active duty members and spouses, uh, are just better at uh, digging up the resources and doing a lot of things, you know, two years in in advance of their separation. Um, and, and people are just more engaged in the process. Yeah, we have the Internet to thank for for that particular piece that uh, it just makes things a whole lot better when people are researching. But I do believe that people can reach a point of, uh, you know, information paralysis. There's just so much out there, and what do you look at, and what source do you go to? There's many people that are not even going to know, you know, who DAV is until they've heard this particular piece here. And how did I keep missing it and so on? It's because the Internet is huge, and unless you you come across us, you're you're not going to know. And the same thing holds true, you know, with, you know, with employment. And so – 
picking a particular model or path to follow, well, where do you where do you start? Well, we're trying to keep our resources simple and not so, you know, abundant that people have too many things blinking in their face and they just get turned off by it and say, hey, I can't I can't look at that website or, you know, whatever the case may be. So what what do they what do they look at? Well, they'll come across us and we'll kind of lead them to resources like one of our partners, Recruit Military, uh, who does the majority of they they are the majority holder of the career fairs that we sponsor. They have really, really great tools right there on their website. And of course you can link to them from our from our jobs page or at re- recruitmilitary.com. So they have a lot of those types of things. So part of it all is employers that are out there that are engaging with us, engaging with one another, to where we're all trying to come up with the best like collection of tools, if you will, that that are going to mean something to the vast majority of people uh, that can kind of get them the next thing, whether it be resume writing, res, you know, translation of military skills. A lot of these things that are really simplified for some people are extremely complex for other people of I didn't have a resume to get in the military, and now all of a sudden I need a resume, you know, to kind of get out of the military. And so there's a host of those things. Uh, but I think the biggest, I think to your point of the one of the biggest obstacles or challenges, I think, are so, to me, and I don't mean it in a disrespectful thing, I think are really veterans themselves. You know, some that are just way overprepared for certain aspects of it and then some that are just way underprepared. And I say that from the fact of the faces that I see coming into our career fairs uh, or that I engage with over the phone. But really coming into a career fair, you have people coming in and, you know, they're coming to a career fair and they're wearing shorts and a Mm T-shirt to a person and they're standing next to somebody that's in a suit and a tie. And the the question apparently doesn't even come across that I'm underdressed or maybe the other guy thinks he's overdressed. In other words, there's a disconnect there of, of how how could that even be? So, um, you know, I think just not being prepared, you know, ahead of time before they get out. You know, I, I remember when I got out, uh, I was because it was a medical situation. Uh, it was just one day, boom, there was order that came in and said, you have five days to clear post. So I had to cram it all in and turn in everything and get off, get off the military base, you know, within five days. Uh, but I wasn't planning on getting out. I was not planning on being injured and, and no one is planning on being injured, but that's just one of those types of cases. But in general, I just think people would benefit greatly from preparing to get out as soon as they get in. And I don't mean that in not focused on the job you're doing in the military, but you got to plan for the day and foresee you're not going to be here forever. You're going to transition at some point. And if you don't have some things information wise, a pathway in case you do get hurt and you get put out, um, you know, you're behind the eight ball as it would be. But like I said, we're seeing a lot more people coming in that have been kind of already doing a lot of things about 18 months to two years in advance of their separation, which is, you know, which is really good. But I I just think they they themselves are probably one of the bigger obstacles. That's great. And I, I wholeheartedly agree with what you're saying, too. It's just if you go into the military, obviously focused on succeeding and doing your best there, but everyone is going to eventually transition out of the military. So if you start, you know, that preparation, if you if you start to do a little bit of work on that, it can add up over time and really put you in a spot to have an easier transition rather than, than approaching it a couple months out, which can leave you scrambling because there's so much to do to get ready for that transition. Yeah, that's, that's and just to kind of, uh, I guess, add to that one point, to be fair on both sides of it, is um, the government also still, you know, military, we still need to do a better job, as I had mentioned, with transition GPS. In fact, I testified once before Congress. And and again, I'm, I just came, you know, my approach was simply to talk about it anecdotally or uh, to simply say, you know, look, I I graduated, I grew up in a farm community and I graduated from high school and went to college because I didn't want to be a farmer and those types of things. And so I went to college and then after college, I I didn't want to be a high school art teacher anymore. I wanted to serve in the military. At least I wanted to have that experience. 
from, you know, really a patriotic sense more than a skill sense. Uh, adventure, all those things. Uh, but I knew nothing really about being military. I mean, I had military people in my family. Uh, but other than that and stories that they told in books and movies, I mean, what do we really know about the military? Well, they teach you. That's what boot camp is. That's what basic training is, or whatever we're calling it. You know, and about eight weeks later, you're marching and talking and looking and all these things like the next guy next to you. And all of these things kind of start falling into place, but it takes a while, you know, and we're talking about eight weeks and then you have some advanced training. And so for me, mine was about 15 weeks before I went to a duty station. And I think some places now they've extended that even more, but like 15 weeks. And I had mentioned to Congress, you know, and they said, do you have any specific recommendations? And they said, well, I, I told them my personal opinion, not even DAV's opinion, but my personal opinion is that transition needs to be longer. You know, that there should be a, a civilian transition hold, maybe perhaps something like, you know, at three years and 11 months, you're done wearing the uniform and you go to you report to civilian transition hold for the last month. And all you're doing is taking classes from finance, you know, fin like a financial hygiene type thing. Make sure you understand that any kind of separation pay you're going to get that that's in good care. Uh, to medical, to career, all of these things, you know, and I said, because, you know, if I knew nothing about the military and it took you 15 weeks to make me somewhat of a soldier, why would you only give me one week of transition classes to make me a civilian when most of these kids are leaving high school and going into the military? And this was their first, you know, so on job, like, uh, so to speak. So, that didn't really get met with any applause or, any, you know, and they didn't really embrace the idea too much because it costs money. And I'm not really sure why that should be a factor because we're talking about the future of our country in bringing these men and women who just served and sacrificed out. We would owe them everything to make sure that they transition well. And giving them a week and pushing them out the door, is it, it needs to be better than that. And... I'm wondering as well is um, in case someone listening is um, unaware of like the, the VA's compensation and pension process and details, could you either you know, maybe point them in a direction where they could learn more about that or talk about how the DAV assists with that? Yeah, sure. Uh, and it is truly a common question. So uh, no one is alone out there because, hey, I knew nothing about it in my own case. And it was if it wasn't, again, for the first DAV guy that I talked to and there, there's other organizations, but we're talking about DAV here. And frankly, uh, I've been with this organization 25 years. I know what our service officers are trained in. You know, it's a 16 month training program to even handle casework. Uh, so anybody out there that, that is looking and, and reviewing the, you know, Googling the regulations and things in your own case, don't do it. Do not represent yourself. Get somebody like DAV, a national service officer with DAV, or if you're still active duty and, and you check and we should have a transition service officer on your military base, uh, which wherever that may be, or, you can simply go to DAV.org, our main website, and there's what is called, you know, find the find the service officer nearest you. And it's a, you know, it's a locator, and you just put your zip code in, and it'll give you the nearest office. You can do that through jobs.dav.org under the four veterans section. It's right there also. Simply type in your zip code, and it'll give you the nearest office. Any question that you want to ask them, should I file a claim to, hey, I'm going to file a claim, but I need some assistance? They will let them, let our folks walk you through the process. It doesn't cost you anything, but it might cost you a lot if you don't at least access it from a, from a question uh, point of view. But the worst mistake that I've seen veterans over, over 25 years of doing this is when they don't need somebody representing them. And they, what, I, I think a lot of it is they think that we charge for our services. We don't. We don't. Absolutely zero dollars. We're a nonprofit organization. We don't do it. We'll never do that. If you want to pay an attorney to go do it, you're not going to get any better representation. Um, in fact, you might get worse representation depending. Uh, but we can answer all of those. We, we you know, make sure that you have an e-benefits account. Uh, if you're if you haven't done that, get on there and and open up your e-benefits account through the VA. Once you have that, 
we can do everything electronically with you. Uh, gone are the days where you had to come and see me in my Chicago, you know, downtown Chicago office or my downtown Manhattan office. It's tough for people, but we also technology has made such huge advances that we can file everything electronically. So we work a lot by email uh, and certainly uh, file things electronically. But, you know, jobs.dav.org under the four veterans tab, you'll find the NSO locator. Just put your zip code in and you can get the NSO nearest you. And if someone is on active duty and they're listening and, and um, they want to get started with with uh, DAV, what's the easiest way for them to, to start this whole process and to kick things off? Uh, well, pretty much the same thing um, uh, the, is to make contact with somebody from DAV. And again, they're going to find uh, we have our, you know, we're a membership based organization. So that means you'll see you know, veterans from all generations out in the community, whether it's on Forget Me Not Day where they're selling Forget Me Nots in front of the grocery store or, you know, just out in the community doing a variety of things or through our van program. If you go to the VA hospital, if you're if you're in that situation where you're going to a VA hospital, we almost always have an office inside the VA hospital. And you simply ask somebody at the information desk, uh, can you tell me where DAV's office is? And they'll do that. Now, understanding those are from the membership-based and the volunteer-based level. Yes, they're knowledgeable people, but at some point you're going to want to interact with, again, one of our national service officers. But you can start, starting a great starting point would be at your local VA hospital. Uh, we're in the yellow pages. You can do the NSO locator, and you can find a whole lot of things because even if you type in, you know, zip code 41091, and that's going to give me my nearest – service office once i contact them i can ask them for local connections and they can they can guide me that way too and you had said something at the start about um the volunteering aspect here and this is i think the 198th interview i've done for beyond the uniform one of the themes that i've seen when i talk to military veterans about their civilian career is many of us miss a sense of purpose, we miss a sense of a mission, and we miss that connection with other people in the military. And so it seems like that volunteering aspect could be a great way for listeners to, to scratch that itch. So one of the things I just wanted to ask about uh, is maybe someone listening is not is themselves not a disabled American veteran, but how else could they get involved in supporting the work that you're doing? Well, you can you can still, whether you're a member or eligible for membership, you don't have to be to be a volunteer. You can still volunteer. We take them in all kinds, and in fact, we, I mean, like I said, our volunteer program is growing, you know, immensely, especially with the volunteerforveterans.org uh, website, which is, <clears throat> it's just so easy. We wanted to make it easy because we realized that there's so many people out there that want to volunteer, again, from a purpose from a I want to just give back to I have free time on this day, what do I do? We're missing a lot of those people with those opportunities that want to give back. And if you, if you make that, you know, it used to be very difficult to register. And if you're going to make the registration process difficult for people to give their time, they're going to walk away and give their time to someone that doesn't have as difficult of a registration process. So it was only likely that we were going to get here at some point. So I'm, I'm personally thankful that like our national voluntary services director, John Kleindienst, you know, I work down the hall from him and uh, he's been working diligently on getting that out there. So same types of things that I, that I was mentioning about getting involved is it's easier than people would think. And you don't have to be you don't even have to be a you know a veteran. You you can be a spouse. You can be somebody that just wants to help veterans. DAV is a great organization that you can jump in the pond with us, you know, and, and give a little bit of your time because you're exactly right, Justin. There's so many people that uh, whether it's through disability and they're not able to continue working beyond the military, or whether it's retiring and they can be a little more choosy in what they want to do. Um, or it's a spouse that's married and caregiving their children is, is a main thing. And then all of a sudden they have, you know, preschool happens and they have some free time on their hand where they can get back. I know that was how my wife did. Volunteering is, it keeps that sense of purpose because when you, when you lose that, 
you know, uh, a lot of other things can kind of creep in and, and and whatnot. So with an organization like DAV, where you're caring for veterans of all generations, they're just something inherently good to sit and deal with people, especially if you've been injured and then all of a sudden you're dealing with someone that's more injured than you. One of our one of the most inspirational people I know. Uh, we have a lot of them in DAV, and that's one of the one of the benefits and beauties of being involved in this organization. I've met so many great human beings with such great stories. But Dave Riley, he's our immediate past national commander. Well, actually, fast forward because Delphine Metcalf Foster is our. We just had our national convention. But Dave Riley was our national com, uh, commander year before last. And Dave was a volunteer at one of our VA hospitals. Dave was a Coast Guard rescue swimmer who contracted a bacteria in his, uh, I believe, in his uh, sinuses. And anyway, developed a deadly, a deadly situation to where they had to amputate all four limbs. And so from going to a motivated, highly motivated rescue swimmer to a quadra, quadra amp overnight was something that most of us can't even grasp. But Dave uh, chose to not let that define him, and he volunteered. I think Dave was volunteering 40 to 60 hours, maybe even more than that, each week at the VA hospital. Um, So that's more than a lot of people, able-bodied people, do at at a job that they get paid for. And this guy was out there doing it. He truly is just one of the most inspirational people. And if it wasn't through his volunteering and giving back, you know, he he himself might have ended up in a bad way. So uh, there's a lot of great things that come out of volunteering. But again, DAV.org, we, there's an easy tab on there. You can simply click on that. Perfect. Well, you've answered a lot of uh, questions for me on this interview, but I always like to keep the last question open-ended. And that is, what have we not covered that you want to make sure you share with listeners before we wrap up? Well, I just I, I really appreciate the opportunity anytime that you know DAV can get our name out there with the with the great things that we do. There's just a tremendous amount, and there's no way even this even though you've been giving with your time here, and there's just no way to cover amply cover you know all of the ground that DAV covers in the way of caring for our nation's veterans and their families. But I would just say you know I guess as a challenge to the listeners out there. Are you a veteran? Are you active duty and you're going to be a veteran soon? Are you a spouse of? Any of those categories. Is there a way that DAV can help you based off of what we talked about today? And if we didn't talk about it, go to DAV.org or jobs.DAV.org, certainly. And we can help with that employment transition, whether you're looking for something new or better, uh, we have a host of those things. And then, of course, all of the other things that where you might fit in, even with our legislative program. And, and people now are much more in tune with things that are going on on Capitol Hill than they ever have been. But our DAV Commanders Action Network and everything that we do with that, that's easy to sign up for. And, again, you don't have to be a member or a veteran to sign up for it. And basically, our, our folks on our legislative staff, we've designed that so you can be involved with everything going on, whether there's a bill coming to the floor for a vote that, that's going to harm veterans or going to help veterans, you know, every voice counts. Every voice is heard. And so you can simply, you would get that alert on your on your email, and you simply turn around and send a, you know, a quick and easy note to your uh, elected officials in your area. And trust me, it truly does work because you get responses on everything that you send in. It is an easy way, and, and most people don't think, uh, I, you know, that I'm going to find myself one day engaged in this. Well, if we don't become engaged or stay engaged, we're going to have people making decisions, as we have, uh, that affect, you know, the 1% of us that have served in the military and those, that, you know, that they're attached to in their families. So I would say the Commander's Action Network, please take a look at that. And that, again, can be found on our main website as well as the volunteerforveterans.org. And if we can help you at jobs.dav.org, uh, we'd love to be able to do that. Uh, and with that, I would say thank you very much, Justin. It's been great. Thank you as well, Jeff. I appreciate the work you're doing. I appreciate the, uh, the time that you took to share this with our listeners. Hey, no problem. Thanks for listening to this episode of Beyond the Uniform. 
There are over 200 free episodes at beyondtheuniform.io. They're classified by the industry of focus, the functional role the person plays, and more. Beyond the Uniform is hosted, produced, and edited by me, Justin Asiri. Our director of outreach, responsible for sponsorship and guest episodes, is Steve Bain. Our editor, responsible for the show notes and text transcripts for all episodes, is Kathleen Dillon. Our data analytics and insights advisor is Andrew Woolridge. If you are enjoying Beyond the Uniform, you can help us out by telling your veterans and friends in the military about this free resource. There is more information on the website about how you can sponsor an episode or donate to our program to help us grow the work that we're doing. Be sure to check out the coaching section of beyondtheuniform.io where you can be paired with professional, subsidized coaches to help you figure out your next career move. You can sign up for our newsletter to be up to date on the latest happenings at Beyond the Uniform. And in each show notes section, there is a link to audible.com, which is providing a free audiobook of your choice to Beyond the Uniform listeners. You get a free book of your choosing, and Beyond the Uniform gets $15 to subsidize the cost of the show, regardless of whether you can continue with audible.com or not. Check that out and more in the show notes for this episode. Keep the feedback coming. Let me know what resources would help you in your career, and we'll do our best to make that happen. Take care, be safe, and I'll be back next week with more interviews with military veterans about their civilian career.